Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to share a bit of the work that uh, I've been working with uh, uh, conservation organization Pacific Wild uh, for a, a number of years. I was really fortunate uh, to be on board this three-masted schooner uh, to, that was uh, on a voyage of exploration and discovery to uh, inventory the endangered watersheds of uh, the central and north coast of British Columbia. It was meant to be a, a one-week voyage, and it turned into uh, about 25 years now of uh, what seems like a real roller coaster of, of nonstop conservation work. And this is what I want to share a bit with you uh, today, uh, largely because with the theme of change, uh, when I look back at what that initial voyage was like to where we are today on, uh, in furthering conservation efforts on this coast, uh, the change has been remarkable and, and dramatic. Back then, we were so naive, we really didn't understand what was there. What we did know, based on some uh, cursory watershed inventories of the temperate rainforest that uh, once stretched from San Francisco all the way to southeastern Alaska, was that uh, south of this uh, uh, shaded area that you see here, uh, every single watershed of consequence had been modified or logged or impacted by hydro development had been uh, significantly altered, all the way from this shaded area, the, the southern portion, <clears throat> of what's become known as the Great Bear Rainforest, all the way to San Francisco. What we did know is that clusters and large, intact, large clusters of intact uh, river systems were still found within this area. And so it was just an, a, a tremendous opportunity of, of really global consequence to be able to go there and begin inventorying, inventorying them, seeing them for the first time, understanding them because of their threatened uh, uh, landscape. But this is a big area. This is half the... the uh, Pacific coast of Canada. Uh, this, is, this represents most of the world's remaining intact uh, temperate rainforest. Uh, this is an area that, that, that's comprised of about a thousand uninhabited islands. Uh, th this is one of the most significant marine ecosystems on the planet, uh, uh, supporting countless, countless species. Uh, it's also home to about a dozen uh, uh, fiercely independent First Nations people uh, that uh, have been stewards of, uh, of their culture in the lands and seas for uh, over 10,000 years. Uh, it's also home to over uh, probably 2,000 genetically distinct or separate runs of, of wild salmon. It's also home to some of the world's most iconic species uh, uh, found both in the rainforest and in the marine environment. So going back then, it was, it was really a remarkable time in the conservation uh, efforts and the environmental movement in, in British Columbia. You know, it's a really a new movement in this province, and it was really at its nascent stages uh, in, the, in the 1980s. So while there were, there were people standing on the roads bringing attention to the deforestation that was happening on the west coast of Vancouver Island, uh, there was virtually no conservation attention focused to the north. And yet on Vancouver Island, say the west coast, there was maybe only a half dozen intact valleys of, uh, left of any size. And, and on the central and north coast, we knew even at that time that there were hundreds and hundreds of them. So the, the opportunities uh, for large-scale wilderness protection conservation was significant. And the responsibility uh, certainly weighed heavily on us. But how do you, what do you do? You know, there's no model. This is, I think, one of the, the, the important themes of, uh, of my talk here, is that there's, there's no model to follow in protecting this planet, to protecting wilderness, especially when uh, a, a, a conservation uh, proposal or, or an area of such conservation uh, size uh, had never been uh, studied or proposed before. Uh, so what scientists and biologists said uh, is that you, you need to really focus on uh, what they call focal species. You know, understand species like grizzly bears that are you know, umbrella species or keystone species that can tell you a lot about the landscape. And perhaps if you protect enough area for large uh, uh, ranging mammals like grizzly bears, you're probably going to capture the protection for less known, less visible, less understood species. And that, that was uh, very much a large part of our initial work, was uh, building a conservation area design for grizzly bears throughout this whole region. And that worked really well for the mainland associated uh, uh, river systems. But we soon learned over the years that you know, these grizzly bears are sleeping half the year. So they don't tell us a whole lot about the landscape uh, for, half the, for half of the year. Uh, they're also more adaptable. You know, they, they can switch from a meat-based diet to a vegetative-based diet uh, fairly quickly. 
Uh, so they certainly are a great representation of the mainland coastal watersheds, the big uh, 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 river valleys uh, below the glacial, glaciers, uh, but yet we knew there was about a thousand islands that were uh, that, that broke or acted as a buffer from the Pacific storms coming in uh, each year, and uh, grizzly bears weren't found on those islands. What we did find, though, on those islands that uh, were wolves that had fully penetrated the whole archipelago of the central and north coast. And this is a, just a remarkable uh, a thing to find because these wolves are so unlike wolves in the continent. They're, they don't have these large herds of ungulates to feed on. And what we were finding is that these wolves are truly sea wolves. They're feeding uh, and making their living off of the ocean, off of the, the, the marine resources. And so the more time that, uh, that I've had to spend uh, studying and observing these wolves over this long period of time, the more I realize that they, they truly are dependent on the ocean for their survival. And few people realize that uh, you know, a, a terrestrial-based large carnivore like a wolf uh, could actually be a, a great uh, uh, indication of the health of the oceans. And this is what we have here on the, on the coast of British Columbia. So these wolves are swimming long distances, are swimming from island to island almost on a daily basis. Uh, their territories are not defined by islands, but by multiple of islands, of, uh, large archipelagos. And so they're swimming from island to island in search of prey base, such as uh, seals and sea lions. Or they're, they're searching uh, their salmon rivers in the fall season for salmon, which is a, a, a critical food supply uh, for them throughout as much as from August all the way up until October. Uh, they're preying on, on pinnipeds, uh, such as seals and sea lions on these rocky islets. Uh, this is a critical food uh, for some of the packs of wolves uh, on, the, on the BC coast. And they're also uh, walking the perimeters of their offshore islands in search of uh, car marine carcasses, uh, such as whales and, and other species that may be coming in from the ocean. So the ocean is such an important provider uh, for, these, for these sea wolves. This wolf here has uh, become very proficient at digging for clams. And uh, when it's not digging for clams, it's pushing rocks over and eating crabs and other intertidal uh, delicacies that, uh, that are found throughout uh, uh, of course, their, uh, their ocean uh, home and ocean territories. It's, uh, it's just been a remarkable journey to uh, immerse myself into the lives of these fascinating animals. They, uh, of course, have a, a culture that is uh, uh, highly social. They're one of the most highly social, socially evolved animals on our planet. And what we've found through uh, uh, molecular studies, through genetic studies, is that these wolves also harbor uh, genetic diversity that's been lost in wolf populations uh, throughout the rest of North America. So this is really, again, uh, they, they represent a great symbol for the wildness of, of our coast because they've never been forced through a genetic bottleneck, so they've never been persecuted to the, to the extent uh, that they've lost their gen genetic diversity, such as the wolves that we find in the rest of the continent. Uh, so even just across the Coast Mountain Range, wolves there, uh, or even just to the north in Alaska, where there's far more people, far more roads, wolves there have been, have been persecuted at rates of 30 and 40 and 50 percent uh, every single year, to the point where they've lost their genetic diversity, their historic uh, uh, genetic makeup. The wolves here on the BC coast still have that, and that's something that makes them especially unique because it gives us a, a true entry point into the, the history of, uh, of this coastline. Uh, so, you know, why is that important? Just imagine if, if someone came to planet Earth and eliminated 30 and 40 and 50 percent of the humans on this planet every single year. Think of how many language groups, how many skin colors, how many uh, how much culture that we would lose, how much diversity within our own species we would lose. It, we'd become so much more homogenous. And this is what's happened with wolves. This is what's happened with a lot of uh, uh, slow reproducing uh, mammals that uh, have been per persecuted to that extent. So it's, it's been an amazing experience to live with wolves that have been largely unbroken by humans. They're still living uh, very much as they have for thousands and, and thousands of years. So a lot of our work at Pacific Wild is about conservation, protecting wildlife. Uh, we engage in science, we engage in, in public advocacy, public education, uh, changing policy. Uh, we have a lot of uh, tools at, at our disposal and we engage in a lot of different approaches to achieve uh, protection. 
And uh, as, as I'm sure many of you heard, uh, recently the BC government recently announced spending millions of dollars uh, to eliminate large populations of wolves in the interior, ostensibly to save caribou. Uh, it's our uh, belief that it will not save the caribou because the true problem is habitat loss, not the wolves. Uh, so we are very much opposed to it. And, and it was uh, not, not very long ago that we uh, were really sitting down wondering, I was actually up on up on the, uh, in the Great Bear Rainforest and, and talking to our communications director about this issue and you know, wondering how are we going to breathe, breathe some new life into this issue. We've got to engage more of the public. We have to educate more people about this issue. Uh, we can't allow you know, the hundreds and hundreds of wolves each year that the BC government wants to target by helicopter uh, to continue. And so uh, our, my, my conservation, um, our communications director, uh, that same day, phoned back and said, you know, Miley Cyrus just uh, uh, posted on Instagram about the wolf cull issue and our website just crashed. And Christy Clark has just responded telling her that she should stick to twerking. And uh, there's suddenly, it's now very much in the news. And we're thinking, well, that was unexpected. But you know, this is kind of like how uh, conservation happens. And so I said, well, why don't you invite Miley up and she can see firsthand of what's happening up here in the Great Bear Rainforest. And she said, phoned back a few hours later and said, well, Miley's flying up to visit you and she's going to land uh, uh, next to your boat and she wants to, <laughs> wants to visit you in the, in the Great Bear Rainforest. And it was just perfect timing because we actually had had uh, some of uh, the world's foremost wolf experts uh, on board that we were doing some, some research with, and uh, we had uh, ecologists and whatnot. And so Miley and her brother Brazen uh, showed up on the boat, and uh, within uh, hours they had grizzly bears around them. They were watching humpback whales breaching, and, and it was just a, a great experience. It, it really allowed them to um, you know, explore uh, these issues. And, and, you know, Miley's coming at this from a very sincere perspective. She's uh, uh, very interested in, in wildlife and, uh, and was really concerned about the wolf cull issue up, here, up in British Columbia. And so she just took the time to come up and, and have a look and talk to people, talking to First Nation elders and, and uh, leaders and, and talking to biologists and staff at Pacific Wild and spent about three days and then off, uh, off her and her brother went. And as soon as they hit landed in Los Angeles and, and uh, mainstream media found out about their visit, uh, we suddenly were on a media marathon that uh, you know, is still almost continuing today. But it allowed us to reach millions and millions of people uh, about this issue. And uh, it, it was quite, it, it, it's just an, an important story because you know, often people ask, you know, how do I get involved in conservation and, and what does it mean? And, and there's so many you know, tools at our, uh, at our disposal to further wildlife conservation, but most of them are very unpredictable. And this was an opportunity where one day we're wondering how are we possibly going to um, you know, build enough of a constituency and inspire enough people about this wolf issue uh, and then it was just a matter of time before we're speaking to millions and millions of people. So opportunistic, uh, absolutely, but uh, important to be able to respond in time when, when uh, issues like that happen. Another mi big issue for us is, is marine conservation. Uh, you know, Canada has uh, uh, the longest coastline in the world and ranks among probably the least in terms of protection uh, in the industrialized world. Uh, we've protected probably less than 1% of our jurisdictional, jurisdictional marine waters, which is just an abysmal failure when it comes to marine use planning. Uh, but why is marine, marine planning so important? Uh, you know, I love this picture of a spirit bear that, uh, of course, is found in the, in the Great Bear Rainforest area uh, because you know, scientists have been studying, why is the white bear white? And one of the compelling... Uh, um, uh, reasons is because white bears blend into the sky and it allows the bears to be more efficient hunters because they're more are more efficient fishers because they're, they're camouflaged against the sky so the salmon can't see them when they when they blend in so well and so when you think about that it's actually the salmon if this is true it's actually the salmon a marine species that has actually changed the color of a bear in the terrestrial world that's how powerful the ocean is we have so much left to do to protect um, our oceans. Uh, it's, it's almost inconceivable how much our weather patterns, our, uh, our climate, uh, the life that supports our coast, it comes from the open ocean, comes from our intertidal waters, and yet they, they re receive the least amount of protection uh, today. This is an area that needs significant attention and uh, something that we, we continue to work on. 
And of course, in a changing ocean, such as we, we see today, where species that aren't native to these waters are coming in, where vast jellyfish blooms are, are taking over our inshore waters. Uh, but we also have so much here to, to celebrate. And, and one of the things that I, re I realized living on the coast for over 20 years is that uh, there are all these seasons that happen. So at the end of, at the closing dawn of winter, uh, thousands and thousands of tons of herring come moving inshore, into our inshore waters. And when they start to spawn, the, uh, the, the water uh, actually turns completely uh, uh, milt covered from the, the amazing amount of uh, females spreading their milt into the water. So you imagine that at the perfect time, you're just sitting there watching the ocean and it's dark blue and suddenly within minutes it completely changes color, completely changes milt and as the tide drops the, the inshore uh, environment is completely covered with uh, 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 hundreds of kilometers of little tiny eggs. 10,000 surf scoters like you see here move in. <coughs> countless, migratory <coughs> countless migratory birds uh, come to feed on the eggs, such a critically important part of, uh, of their life cycle. Uh, and one of the things that I've found so fascinating is that uh, an individual pack of wolves, the same ones, show up on the shore side uh, to feast on these eggs. And they might start, uh, they might have access to these nutritional, nutritious eggs for up to six weeks uh, of the time. So imagine that wolves are actually feasting on caviar along the beaches. And I always thought that uh, it would be a wonderful uh, uh, experience or a wonderful image, you know, with the photojournalism that we do, be a wonderful experience to be able to take a picture of wolves, uh, the rainforest and the ocean combined together. And uh, I snuck up on this wolf and he came down and, and I managed to get a few pictures of it. But the thing is that the work that we do, it's not so much that uh, we're just taking pretty pictures, but we're trying to tell stories with these images. We're trying to inspire people about these images so that they will respond and that it'll, they'll serve as a a catalyst for change. So uh, film work, photojournalism, it's a critically important part of our work. Um, sustainable fisheries is such an, uh, also an important part of uh, conservation issues facing uh, the BC coast. Um, the unsustainable herring kill fishery, supporting First Nations such as the Heltzik First Nation in, in their w bid against uh, the industrial kill fishery because they have a, a, a sustainable alternative. So this is up in Bella Bella where they're trying to convince the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to stop the kill fishery, allow them to build a sustainable fishery. These, this is just one story of many that these coastal communities are facing as they try to protect their lands and, and waters. Um, we know that in, in this province, uh, one of the biggest issues that it was only a few years ago that uh, was facing us was the Northern Gateway and Bridge Pipeline that was being built to the, the north coast of British Columbia. And our supporters, and even, some of our supporters even said, you know, you can't fight every oil company in the world. It's impossible. You've got to, uh, you've, you've, you've got to give up on some issue. And if we had uh, listened to that, the, the uh, face of British Columbia, and I think who we are as a society would be very different today because nobody listened to that advice. And I think it wasn't just the environmental movement that fought it, it was people across British Columbia of all walks of life, including in particular First Nations. But it was everyone who said, you know, we don't want oil tankers going through such a magnificent coastal paradise. And so from the business community to, again, every walk of life, People spoke out and people said no. And I think it was a changing moment in this province because as we saw just recently in this federal election and as we've uh, just heard with uh, uh, the, uh, the incredible uh, amount of, because of the incredible amount of opposition, uh, in all likelihood, the Northern Gateway uh, pipeline is probably dead and an oil tanker ban will be in the, in the future for the Great Bear Rainforest. And I, I wanna leave on that point because it's such an important part of history in this province because it wasn't the environmental movement that stopped that issue. And in, in a way, we might find that this was a turning point in our history that killed the environmental movement, or at least the environmental movement is now just an idea and that it's been replaced by something far more powerful, which is the voice of all of British Columbians. And it's something I, I know we can all be extremely proud of. I want to leave it there. I thank you very much.